Hi folks, I'm Rupert. We're here at the Museum of the Jewellery Quarter. The central part of the museum is this abandoned uh, Victorian jewellery factory of a company called Smith & Pepper. And I'm now going to show you some jewellery manufacturing techniques as practised by their skilled workers. So we're here at the peg bench, uh, it's called. And very many of these handcrafting tools and techniques have been in this trade for thousands of years. So, for example, <coughs> to kick off with, here is a jeweller's drill which is commonly called the bow drill or Archimedes drill and it's a very ancient origin because this was invented a mere 3,000 plus years ago by the ancient Egyptians and certain jewellers and silversmiths still use it because you've got a very fine degree of control compared to an electric drill so it revolves both clockwise and anti-clockwise and as it's doing this it's drilling down through the metal if I speed up a bit, you'll see that very quickly you're down through your material and any gold or silver filings coming away from the work thankfully drop down into this leather below the bench uh, which captures your lemel and lemel are your gold and silver filings and then those are handed back into the boss eventually because he's weighing out the precious metal and then weighing it back in again. So, once you've prepared your hole you've then got a starting point to work out from and a jeweller would generally work out from there to do the design they're doing by sawing out from that point and the designs would be of particularly a particularly accurate nature partly because that's how thick your saw blades are but also because the sort of trained jewellers in the past uh, had such a thorough apprenticeship that for example the 14 year old trainee would be given a piece would be given a piercing saw to practice with and they'd be expected to practice with this day in day out for around about six months then the rest of their apprenticeship was just another six and a half more years on top of the six months so it was a seven year apprenticeship and it was said that the Birmingham jewellers were used to working within a thousandth of an inch accuracy without deviating one way or another so this is the piercing saw Smith and Pepper, this particular company would headhunt their trainees from Moseley Art College it had a silversmithing course so that young trainee was already used to working in precious metals the trainee would be taken under the wing of the older jeweler uh, and that older jeweler would give them very detailed designs to practice doing and that would get them used to all of the tight twists and turns you can do with a blade of this thickness so for example for the design i'm doing i now need to completely about face and that's exactly what you can do with a blade of this thickness so, most of the work of the jeweller on the bench takes place onto this little triangle of wood. And this little triangle of wood is specifically called the jeweller's peg or the jeweller's pin. Of course, after a period of time of being sawn on and sawn into, this gets quite worn out. So, because gold particles love absorbing themselves into a piece of wood like that, that would be thrown in the furnace here at Smith & Pepper. It wouldn't go in the bin. It would be too loaded of gold. And the thing about Birmingham jewellery trade is, is it was a trade of generally small firms living and working in the houses of the quarter. So the floorboards were worth tens of thousands of pounds. So anyway, I don't know quite what this shape is. It's some kind of wonky mouse's head or something. Once you've created your components, you now need to build up the piece of jewellery. And one of the main assembly methods in jewellery making would be to solder the pieces together. So what we've got here at the edge of the bench of all of the jewellers workstations is this horizontal Bunsen burner, which was invented here in the jewellery quarter for the jewellers. And it was given the world's pretty much most undescriptive name because this thing is called the Birmingham Side Light totally undescriptive name we've got going here but it's a very effective uh, means of heating up your uh, article but not with the initial orange flame because that's nowhere near hot enough to solder your components pieces together you need a very hot blue flame and exactly when it was devised I'm not sure but a method to raise the temperature here to a very hot blue flame but also to create a needle like point of flame which the jewellers could deliver to exactly the right point of the jewellery. Uh, some bright spark came up with the idea of merely blowing through the flame with a brass blow pipe. And this creates a needle-like point of flame. And if I blow down onto one of these things, these are where you'd place your components to be soldered together. 
and this is called a jeweler's wig a jeweler's boss and I've even heard it called the devil so this is the assembly platform where you place your components and I'll blow down onto it and you'll see just how quickly it gets hot just by blowing through this orange flame with this brass blow pipe so here we go So that is 600 degrees centigrade, almost straight away. It's a perfect temperature if you work with gold alloys. And jewelers could also circular breathe like musicians do whilst using these things. So they could keep the point of flame on the article for as long as they needed to. They'd be applying exactly the right intensity of flame though, because too much heat and you could melt clean through the body of the bangles they were making. And not enough heat and your solder metal won't liquefy and flow to join the two pieces together. And they could circular breathe with such skill on this side of the mouth. That they even had tons of control left here to smoke a cigarette. They're very, very uh, calm, centred workers. Alf Dealey, one of the older jewellers on the other side of the bench here, he was such a calm and steady worker that he could do his work while smoking a cigarette from start to finish without dropping a single piece of ash. They were very, very skilled workers, the, the people who'd undertaken this seven-year apprenticeship. And in the Victorian period, it said that our jewellers were the best paid of the workforce in Birmingham, the skilled workers, that is. And it said they lived in more comfortable dwellings, they wore better clothes which didn't betray the common working man, and they were less prone to dissipation, whatever that is, I'm not sure. What we'll do now is we'll show you how the component pieces were made. Generally this firm, um, when it had a large order, it would go and buy the machine tools I've showed you already, the dies and punches. Those would be fitted into the machines, which I'll show you next. And then, for example, one half of their bamboo bracelet would be stamped out in one go. And then those components would travel across to the bench here and they would be sold together to form such exotic articles as Smith & Pepper's bamboo bracelets. One fella came on one of our tours recently, he said, um, uh, I used to buy lots of um, 18 and 22 karat gold jewellery from Smith & Pepper to sell, it, uh, sell in Jersey and their snap bangles were the best in the trade. Smith & Pepper and very many other companies uh, mass-produced jewellery and what enabled them to speed up the process vastly were machine tools such as these and these are called dies and punches and they fit into various machines which give them the force to stamp out sort of those particular component pieces and these come you know some are quite simple as you can see here this is just like stamping something out with a cake cutter but sort of dies and punches came in varying degrees of elaborateness and with these particular ones these are just the die of the die and punch set for making one half of your bangle so you can see here that sort of the flat sheet of gold would be stamped with its curve and all of the detail and decoration of that one half of the bangle. And this particular company, um, throughout their factory, have a collection of 7,700 sets of these dies and punches. So that's 7,700 different designs. And the firm themselves produced a very wide array of jewellery. They produced cufflinks, they produced lockets, crosses, uh, pendants, brooches, earrings, but their main product, their main article were bangles and bracelets and in particular the bamboo bracelet which um, we'll see sort of being produced a bit later on or I'll, I'll demonstrate that. But also snake jewellery was a massive line with this company as well and this particular firm started producing a great line of snake jewellery, you can see the dies and punches for the earrings up there. They started producing that after a certain Tutankhamun was discovered 
and there was a big fashion for all things Egyptian. Uh, there was one man here at the works called Arthur Brewer. He was a jack of all trades around the factory. Uh, his main job I'll show you a bit later on because he, he used the dies and punches in the machines to stamp out the designs. Um, but we asked him, how did you remember sort of where you'd put them with so many um, different designs? And um, eventually uh, he told us that sort of the old designs were further up. And um, but there wasn't a massive amount of cataloging. He just knew instinctively where they'd been put because he was looking after them. This is, this is his job to look after them. And what we have here is a picture of Smith & Pepper's 1960s, 1970s advertising. Um, and it shows the, the array of jewellery they were producing. And many of the component pieces here were stamped out with the machines. And so this process at this factory and very many other factories combined machine te te uh, techniques alongside very, very hard one and uh, uh, long practice craft skills, handcrafting skills, and we'll see some of those on the bench in just a minute. <laughs> 